Hello, I'm Dr. Cynthia Stunkel, and I'm very pleased to be here today with you. Uh, I wanted to just mention that I sit on a data and safety monitoring board. That's my only uh, disclosure. And I am so pleased to be here to participate in World Menopause Day. Uh, it was a great honor for me to be asked to do this. And I wanna thank the IMS uh, board for selecting me for this honor. Um, I wanted to recognize Professor Stephen Goldstein, who was the first one who talked to me probably a year and a half ago about this possibility. And Dr. Rodney uh, Baber, who really has helped to usher through the process of both the white paper and some of the details related to this presentation. Um, I was very pleased that we were focusing on cardiovascular disease in women. I think this is an incredibly important arena and one that really just is gonna make all the difference in the lives of women and our patients. Um, the focus of this white paper though, you might go, well, we're the International Menopause Society. So why are we talking about things like reproductive milestones across the lifespan? And it's because I really thought that over the last five years or so, that this information has been compelling and emerging evidence that the cardiovascular health of women, when we see them at midlife, really is reflecting a number of reproductive events that have occurred over their lifespan. So the goal of my presentation today is to review the impact of cardiovascular disease in women, um, consider the spectrum of cardiovascular risks, which are really growing, um, highlight female reproductive milestones in terms of how these might relate to future cardiovascular risk, and then finally, just review some of the recommendations for minimizing the risk of cardiovascular disease in women. So there's no question starting with the World Heart Federation that cardiovascular disease, which include the common clinical manifestations of heart attack and stroke, is the leading cause of death in women worldwide. Uh, women with cardiovascular disease, however, continue to be underdiagnosed and undertreated due to misconceptions I don't know whether they're vulnerable to cardiovascular risk, whether they're presenting with cardiovascular risk because the symptoms may vary, uh, whether they just don't think it can happen to them or we don't think it can happen to them. And then just the lack of awareness that this is an ongoing, critically important issue. Again, just this number, one in three deaths in women is caused by cardiovascular disease. I hope you had the chance to encounter this Lancet Commission piece on women and cardiovascular disease uh, with the goal of reducing the global burden by 2030, just around the corner. But the uh, authors of this commission are really powerful, inspiring um, women, leaders in the world of cardiology, and I think really took the mantle of this to heart themselves because this discusses not just some of the general things we think about with cardiovascular disease, but really takes a global approach. So uh, wherever you may be, think about taking a look at this. And these are some of their just bottom line points. Number one, women with heart, cardiovascular disease, again, understudied, underrecognized, underdiagnosed, and undertreated. Um, Sex-specific mechanisms in the pathophysiology remain poorly understood. So much of an arena for more research. Myocardial infarction and cardiovascular disease mortality, and this scares me, are increasing in younger women. So the kind of risk factors that we see in these younger women, more obesity, hypertension, diabetes, it's happening. It's taking a toll. And I kind of worry you as these young women, by the time they get to menopause, may often have had cardiovascular events. And then sex-specific and other underrecognized risk factors, and I'll talk about some of those in a minute, do contribute to this global burden. So lots to learn um, and you know, miles to go before we sleep. I don't know where in the world you may be watching from, but I think maps like this are always really interesting. I think all of us like to compare, you know, where, are, where am I on this? And I'm over here in San Diego, California, but you can see that the region of the U.S. is an orange. It says we're getting up there uh, as far as the prevalence of CBD per 100,000 patients. Um, maybe one of you are living in these cool blue areas where the numbers aren't so high, but there's no question that if we look at this map 
five years down the line, we're gonna be seeing more of the warm colors and less of the cool. The American Heart came out and just said that, you know, we were doing pretty well for about four decades and the rates of um, CBD were declining, but that benefit is now decelerating. Or I've talked in the past about stagnation as another word. In other words, we're backsliding, we're going downhill and um, we've got to notice this and do something about this. These adverse trends are observed in women. They're also observed in men to some extent. But I think women are more vulnerable to some of the disparities by race, ethnicity, and sadly, when we look at care disparities versus men, these are still there and have been there for more decades. So integrating women-specific risk factors into quantitative risk assessment across the lifespan is a goal, it's necessary, it hasn't happened yet, but I think we can still at least be aware of these events and build them into our, uh, our care plan and our consciousness. And we can build them into our perception of risk. And some of you have seen me use this slide before. I always use this slide because I think it's so, this concept is so important. If you don't really buy into this, that your patients at cardiovascular risk, it's unlikely that you're gonna really recommend preventive strategies. If she doesn't buy into it, when you tell her you are at cardiovascular risk, then she's not gonna try to take better steps towards a healthier life. So this perception of risk, is something that we really need to work towards gaining. So, so what are these risks? And I've taken them as laid out in the Lancet Commission. Um, you could find a little bit different groupings uh, in other expert groups, but nevertheless, I think that this is a very good way to be thinking about these things. The well-established risks, the under-recognized risks, and then finally sex-specific risk factors. So everybody's familiar with these. These are the kind of uh, considerations. If you do a, a risk calculator, it's going to ask you questions about this. And I was I was surprised to see um, in the in the New England Journal of Medicine yesterday that according to the Global Cardiovascular Risk Consortium, so we're talking global, about 60% of cardiovascular disease in women might be attributable to these key risk factors that we know about. But that says to me, that's 40% that we haven't explained. So we have to look to some of the under-recognized risk factors. We know that women may be more vulnerable to psychosocial things like depression, um, just the incredible stress of living in an abusive or a violent relationship, and then so on and so forth with ills of our societies, um, ills of our healthcare system, ills of our world that can factor in. But when I read these and think about stress, it really reminded me of the Interheart study that reported its findings maybe a couple decades ago now. But what really stood out to me was the idea that stress for women, and they just said, are you stressed? They didn't have some special, you know, check off the box to um, calculate it. Just do you perceive stress was a stronger risk factor than diabetes. Think about that. That's a profound thing. And then finally, the sex-specific risk factors, which is what I want to talk about today, um, include a number of things, like at the top of the list is premature menopause, so that's something that we're very familiar with, but also in addition to that, the um, adverse pregnancy outcomes, including gestational diabetes, the hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, and systemic inflammatory conditions, which have, these have been recognized in some combination or another by the World Heart Federation, the European Society of Cardiology, uh, the US uh, cardiology groups as quote, risk enhancing factors. So it doesn't mean that we can say add 25%, add 10%, whatever, but just saying that we should pay attention to these. And if these risk factors are present, then that means that um, as we make an assessment for that woman going forward, we have to dial up her perceived risk or our calculated risk uh, by a couple levels. And so I don't know if you've had the chance to see some of these papers. I would say over the last five years, there has been a real burgeoning number of studies, of consensus documents. And one of the things that I find really exciting that this paper really, I think, underscores 
is the need for interdisciplinary collaboration. You're seeing cardiologists, gynecologists, and endocrinologists. I'm an endocrinologist, so I like to see that on the list. But, um, and a number of the US papers have also focused on this. And the Lancet Commission, the Global Commission focused on this. We've got to start working together more. And then the final thing that I find kind of intriguing as these uh, papers present this data is looking at the spans across the lifespan, starting in childhood with things like menarche, uh, looking at a number of conditions that I know you're familiar with in your work. I'd say the two big ones are adverse pregnancy outcomes and some of the various issues about menopause, which I know you've just heard a fantastic presentation from Dr. El Cowdery about this. And so I'm not gonna be going into that in great detail, but I have a couple things that I wanted to include. Um, and so what I thought we'd do, I tried to cover these in a fair amount of detail in the white paper. What we're gonna do today is kind of uh, have a brisk run through a number of these things, just to kind of increase your awareness and um, see if some of them might be new to you that you haven't heard about before. So again, mindful that usually, at least in the past, heart attack and stroke came on in the 60s and the 70s, but this gives us this entire reproductive lifespan to look for unique risk identification and hopefully intervene early in risks. And I like to say, let's open the window of opportunity to optimize cardiovascular health in women. So let's begin um, with our run through. And this is looking at the menstrual cycle as a window. A menstrual cycle, it seems kind of mundane, seems as it's something that should just be happening. But I really like this committee opinion that ACOG put out, I don't know, 15, almost 20 years ago, where they said that uh, regarded, regarding menstruation in girls and adolescents, that we should be using the menstrual cycle as a vital sign. I tell this to our residents, I tell this to our fellows, I tell this to our medical students ask about the menstrual cycle and you've got to know what's going on. Certainly if your field is gynecology, that's something that you're like, this is routine. But uh, for those of us that didn't necessarily get brought up that way, we might not be thinking about it as much. This is just one example of one report that looked at menstrual cycle regularity, the length of the menstrual cycle across the reproductive lifespan, and then said, does this have any bearing at all on the risk of premature mortality? This was from the Nurses' Health Study, which I think probably most of you are familiar with as a prospective cohort study, almost 80,000 women who started with a pretty fresh start, no evidence of cardiovascular disease or profound risk factors. And they just asked them, tell me about your menstrual cycles at these ages, at the time that they were enrolled and being followed. And then they looked for another couple decades to see what happened with mortality. And the bottom line was that they found an association, particularly between those who had very irregular or um, absent menstrual cycles, very long cycles. And it was about of the magnitude of a 22 to 50% increase in premature death, but still associated with irregular menstrual cycles. They did all the appropriate adjustments. And, and I think this confirmed, and there have been certainly other studies that have looked at this, that regular menstrual cycles are indeed a marker of good health. And I'm glad that um, ACOG said we should think of them as a vital sign. So one group of women that we know do not have regular menstrual cycles are the women with polycystic ovary syndrome. And this, I think, is another window into cardiovascular health. We know that these women have, um, a number of them have the metabolic syndrome. They may start with individual cardiovascular risk, but they seem to kind of coalesce. Uh, complicated by hyperandrogenism. And we've had studies for some time that have looked at subclinical risk in these women, but I think there's been maybe a little bit of a date of really being willing to, you know, put that stake in the ground that these women are at increased risk for cardiovascular events. Um, this is just one meta-analysis I wanted to show you that talks about the rate of ischemic heart disease in women with polycystic ovary syndrome. And just going right to the bottom line, you can see that it's uh, you know, substantially to the right of one. And the odds ratio for this was 2.77, almost a threefold risk of ischemic heart disease events. And so I think it's a, of no surprise then that the 2000, 
23 international evidence-based guidelines came out very strongly stating that PCOS should be included as a cardiovascular risk factor, should maybe be included, like we're talking about some of the pregnancy events and the assessment tools. Um, women with PCOS, when you're seeing them in your office, should be considered at risk of CVD and maybe CVD mortality. And they should be assessed and counseled about cardiovascular risk factors. Um, and from the get-go, from the early earliest time that you see these women, we need to be discussing and prioritizing preventive strategies for them. The next group I wanted to touch on was infertility. This was sort of a newer one, and this came up as uh, maybe a little bit of a surprise. This is a paper that was uh, earlier this year, again, from the Nurses' Health Study. And I was also surprised that about one in four of these women reported infertility. Uh, so the findings were that there was a greater risk of coronary heart disease, not huge, but significant. Uh, the earlier they knew that they were infertile, the higher the risk. And I found the causes of infertility to be pretty interesting, particularly uh, endometriosis uh, being listed. Uh, Hugh Taylor was at the Menopause Society meetings in Philadelphia last week, and we were talking, and he said, of course, endometriosis is a disorder of inflammation. So it really makes sense that like some of the other standard inflammatory conditions like rheumatoid arthritis or lupus, that increased inflammation would be associated with an increase of uh, cardiovascular disease. So I thought that was an interesting one. The one that I mentioned that has a lot of attention is that of pregnancy and pregnancy uh, as a window into cardiovascular disease. And this is one of the earlier figures that I saw when uh, these papers started coming out about five years ago, but I like it because in one picture, it tells so much of the story. So starting at the top panel, when women are pre-pregnancy, they haven't conceived yet, but you know we see this constellation of risk factors and we're seeing more of these, and I know you're seeing more of these in your young women in your practices. Um, and then there's a number of things we can't see or necessarily measure in the office that we know are there uh, that may impair their hemodynamic adaptation to pregnancy that are associated with uh, endothelial dysfunction, leads to placental dysfunction, and again, inflammation, inflammation, inflammation. So during their pregnancy, then we're seeing the hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, gestational diabetes, and then a number of issues that relate to the uh, well-being of the fetus and the outcome for the offspring. And so these are very disturbing as well. And again, postpartum men, these women may have ongoing endothelial dysfunction. There's some thinking that maybe pregnancy is just a stress test, another really powerful stress test that unmasks some of this pre-existing risk that may already be present in these women. And finally, again, inflammation. So that we see in these patients, if we're paying attention and they're not lost to follow up, things like hypertension, diabetes, obesity, metabolic syndrome, and again, all adds up to cardiovascular risk. So one thing that came to my mind as well, I've been telling you about some of these other reproductive milestones that have an increase of 20%, 40%. What kind of risk do we see in women with these pregnancy disorders? So this was a really, I think, powerful umbrella review, all these meta-analysis and reviews, eight to 10 years follow-up, and looked at different categories, composite cardiovascular outcomes, ischemic heart disease, stroke, and then heart failure. And here's what they found. You know, we're not talking 10 or 15 or 20 percent anymore. We're talking 300 percent when we look at women who've had recurrent preeclampsia, an incredibly high risk group, and one that um, increases the risk of heart failure uh, in a powerful way. A twofold greater group, and again, preeclampsia is a tough one. Preeclampsia might be one of the most challenging from a cardiovascular systems wise thing. Uh, with a in twofold increase in composite outcomes, twofold increase in ischemic heart disease, twofold increase in stroke, um, gestational hypertension, not so bad. In they also include in this um, table some of the uh, consequences with 
uh, fetal implications, the preterm birth, these uh, 50 to, to 90 percent increase. And then some of the ones I showed you earlier, like um, early menarche, uh, PCO comes into the maybe less than one and a half fold risk. And then the good news for patients that ask, you know, what are the benefits of breastfeeding? Well, longer duration of breastfeeding reduces cardiovascular risk. I'm not sure we emphasize that enough. So these pregnancy risks are serious ones. And I think they're ones that we really need to embrace. Um, I wanted to just make a comment on this paper that came out this year, because they talked about not just optimizing pre-pregnancy health uh, for outcomes in pregnancy and postpartum, but also thinking about outcomes in the offspring. And I've talked about some of the um, you know, terrible events that can happen, but there are other consequences. So here's our young girl in her adolescence, pre-pregnancy. You know, we know what we're seeing, at least in the US society, about obesity, tendency towards diabetes, maybe some hypertension even by young adulthood. She becomes pregnant. She has an adverse pregnancy outcome. And then we anticipate that somewhere between middle life and older age, that she may present with a cardiovascular disease, which is kind of a consequence we're learning of those adverse pregnancy outcomes. But I wanted to point your attention to this graph, which I really hadn't seen so many uh, other reports that really called attention to it in this way, because I'm talking about the inflammation, the hemodynamic changes during that pregnancy. You know, here's this person who's experienced that whole pregnancy. And so following birth and, and early childhood, we need to keep an eye on these patients as well, who have also experienced this adverse pregnancy outcome. And it was interesting to me, there was a study, a Danish study uh, that came out earlier this year that said women with hypertension in their pregnancy had offspring that tended to have more diabetes. And so we're kind of tending to see some of these metabolic carry throughs uh, into the next generation. And so the cycle begins again. And I'll come back to talking about some of the, the lifestyle measures that we may need to be instituting in our children as well. So what all this has led to, and I think this is very positive and may also reflect some of the increasing numbers of young women cardiologists that are looking at this, is uh, the whole concept of cardioobstetrics and having a team that follows women through this entire life cycle of pre-planning, of pregnancy, delivery planning, postpartum, to make sure that they don't get lost in the cycle and to make sure that they're appropriately monitored. So let's turn to breast cancer in a window. This is, you know, not necessarily, you could say, how do you really consider this in the reproductive milestones? But I think we know that our treatments can cause reproductive havoc in a lot of our patients with breast cancer. But even going a step earlier, one thing that I hadn't really appreciated was how shared risk factors can be important for breast cancer and heart disease. So we need to think about that. We've learned, and I think this part is really interesting, how we put this perspective on, oh, she has breast cancer. In certain groups of women, we're doing a really good job getting them to five years uh, after their diagnosis, doing well. And the, here's breast-specific mortality at that point. And here's other mortality, sevenfold greater risk of other causes of mortality than their breast cancer, of which a third of these are from cardiovascular disease. We don't see this so much with women at higher stages, younger, and they seem to maintain their breast cancer uh, mortality predominance. But think about that. Think about that. We do a good job. She gets through her cancer and now she might have heart disease. And if we look carefully at the breast cancer therapies, uh, I think we can explain some of this. We know that induced ovarian failure can occur and the issues related to that, but there are direct cardiovascular injury that can contribute to heart failure with chemotherapy. Radiation therapy can cause injury to a number of different parts of the cardiac anatomy, but we're learning in the last year, there have been reports that women who have left-sided breast radiation therapy might have as high as two and a half fold increased risk of cardiac events on that basis alone. And finally, the endocrine therapies, particularly aromatase therapies uh, can contribute. So just as I was talking about uh, cardioobstetrics, Cardio-oncology can be important. I just wanted to show you just quickly, uh, this was a comparison looking at CIRM therapies, adjuvant therapies versus AI. And with the CIRM therapies like tamoxifen, we do see an increase in venous thromboembolic events, 
But look at all the red with aromatase inhibitors. We see increase in risks like hypertension, dyslipidemia, metabolic syndrome, and we see increase in events. So, you know, just being mindful that we're doing our best to um, preserve these women's health, but there are other costs uh, in treating their breast cancer. So screening for and identification CVD risk factors uh, are important. Um, Promoting healthy lifestyle from the get-go is important, both for benefits to their treatment as well as, um, you know, good data that it helps reduce recurrence. Um, if a woman has a, a history of treated breast cancer, you know, we're not done with her. We need to keep working on this going forward. Uh, keep in mind that a cardiology team might be helpful depending on how she was treated and her current uh, clinical situation. So in the final moments, I wanted to turn to menopause as a window. Um, and when putting together the consumer information, I, I said the cardiovascular risk represents a lifetime of choices in how we live, experiences. I maybe should have added uh, our genetic proclivity, but menopause offers the opportunity of a single point in time to step back, take stock, and do all you can towards promoting future cardiovascular health really for the rest of your life. And again, I know so many details of what happens at the menopause transition uh, and cardiovascular risk have already been uh, presented. I wanted to touch just briefly on reproductive uh, lifespan and make a comment about hormone therapy. So again, the reproductive lifespan, menarche to menopause, around 40 years. Uh, but we have learned that cardiovascular risk, risk increases when that uh, reproductive lifespan decreases, and that would be associated with an age of menopause at less than 40 years. And so this was another large analysis looking at 15 observational studies, 300,000 women that identified higher risk in women with premature menopause. And let me just show you how those ages laid out. Here's the age at natural menopause. So I'm not talking about surgical menopause here, just natural premature menopause. And the women um, less than 40 are at the top. You can see that they had about four events per thousand person years uh, relative to like a premenopausal rate of 1.1 and that their risk overall was about about a 50 percent increase which goes along with what we've been looking at um, one question that always comes to mind for me though is you know which is the chicken and which is the egg so we're talking with the international menopause society you're saying it's estrogen deficiency. You know, of course, this is related to estrogen deficiency. But I think we need to be open-minded when we look um, at some of these risks as to whether they really might also have some shared origins or, you know, genetic is getting a lot of attention leading to premature aging. So I think there's some really exciting research going on in this, looking at telomere length, looking at a chip, this clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential, provocative with links of uh, early menopause and heart disease. So I think more to come in this arena. For women that have experienced early menopause, there's no question that uh, literally all expert groups, um, and we, uh, Anne Gombell and I highlighted this in our recent piece, uh, that in the absence of contraindications, and in this setting, I do call it hormone replacement therapy, uh, should be given. It should be initiated soon after diagnosis. We recommend higher doses for these younger women, trying to emulate levels in menstruating women, and recommend that they keep taking it until the time of natural menopause when we can reassess and then decide about uh, continuing in the future. I was very intrigued to see the data from the WHI looking at MHT and mortality. Uh, this was particularly in women, and now I am talking about surgical menopause who had BSO, and as the age got younger and younger, the mortality benefit increased, increased for those on um, CEE alone. So I think, again, this is an impetus to make sure that we are identifying these women and unless they have contraindications to make sure that we're treating them. Uh, you know, I like this slide because you can just sum it up and say there's been a long and winding road about the hormone story um, and how we should and shouldn't be doing it. I think right now I'm very comfortable saying that looking at hormone therapy uh, for women who, and you all know these mantras, who are under the age of 60, 10 years since menopause, who we've ruled out contraindications, evaluated their cardiovascular disease risk, and if they're low risk, sky's the limit. If they're intermediate risk, we recommend transdermal therapies. 
And then just be mindful that as the risk increases, and I think we might be seeing more of this increased risk by the time they become menopausal, that we um, might want to consider other options. I wanted to turn then to just in the final moments, just talking about um, healthy behaviors. Um, I lifted this from uh, the new Life's Essential 8. This used to be uh, Life Simple 7. What has been added on is recommendations to get healthy sleep. Uh, and I think these are things that we know and our patients know. They honestly do work. Uh, we need to do them, at least in the US. And I showed you we're in that orange color because, because. Um, the prevalence of ideal cardiovascular health, I'm kind of embarrassed to tell you this, is less than 1%. Uh, and even if we look at our kids, if we look at you know, prime of life, teenage years, only half. Here's women getting pregnant, only a third. Here's women approaching and going through menopause, one in 10. And by the time we hit our golden years, one in 25. So miles to go before we sleep. Uh, and just remembering that I've been talking about heart disease, but there are a lot of benefits health-wise for these uh, better living. And who doesn't want to maintain cognitive function, have a longer health span uh, in our golden years? So uh, the bottom line is that clinical education has to emphasize risk factors. I, again, I'm so proud and pleased to be able to participate in this World Menopause Day. You know, interdisciplinary collaboration, we get more done when we work together. And finally, research, awareness, um, we're all aware of these. And uh, depending again on your particular country, have a look uh, because they did a very good job in that Lancet consensus of identifying geographical priorities. So with that, I'll close. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much for in, uh, this invitation. Um, I hope you look at the white paper and I hope you think about cardiovascular disease in women. Thank you.